Ever since I come to Michigan State, I've often been asked this kind of question. Why are you Chinese so rich? How come, yeah, <laughs> how come you can afford that many nice cars? I'm sure a lot of you have the same question too. I mean, this question for me could be very interesting, especially last year with the help from my family. I just bought the very first car in my life, which is a second-hand Ford. So for me, sometimes sitting in my second-hand car, I question myself too. Why on earth am I so rich? <laughs> when I get asked this kind of question, I often just explain to people, you know, we have a huge international, a Chinese international student population here in Michigan State. According to the data I pulled out from Office for International Student Scholars, back in 2014, the fall semester, we had 4,793 students that were studying here and sharing the campus with us. So even though you might see a few of the super fancy cars and driving around our campus, they actually never make up as the mainstream of the story, not even close. But this idea, this mis misunderstanding of all Chinese are rich sometimes does cause problem. Back in 2012, there was a series of incidents that happened around our campus in which a number, a number of the cars owned by our international students, especially the Chinese, got painted with yellow paint in Chinese characters saying, go back to China. I found this rather interesting. According to an interview I did with a few of the students that were involved in this incident, two of the cars were actually owned by two Korean students and one is owned by a Malaysian. You know, I'm not so sure as to why those guys want those people to go to China. <laughs> 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 Indeed, a negative attitude going on um, in, in, your, in East Lansing, um, that kind of targeting our Chinese international students. And we are often portrayed as this young ignorant kid who is trying to show off their family wealth by buying these fancy cars. Is this really the case? Let me just show you what the students really have. In early February, I actually ran a survey myself, and I was very fortunate to get 200 students, Chinese students, to join me into this survey. From the data I collected, more than half of the students don't even have a car. And of the other half, 31% got a pre-owned car, and only 17% bought a new one. But when I first look at this data, I was thinking, you know, 70%, that's it's still a large uh, proportion of the population, considering we have that many Chinese students here. That's, that is a lot of new cars that has been bought. And also, in my survey, I took the, the one next step and asked my students, what do you really have? Some of the top brands that pop onto my list are things like Volkswagen, BMW, Audi, and Ford, which are all very nice cars. So how come the Chinese students have this disposable income to buying all this good stuff? To understand the Chinese family wealth problem, one thing should never be left out of the picture. That is the one-child policy. You know, it only allows one child per household. But the term sometimes could be pretty misleading because it does allow a number of exceptions, and most of the ethnic minorities, they don't have to follow this rule. This policy was first enforced back in 1979. And then when we look at the age of our Chinese student here, uh, most of them are born in the 90s, just like I am. I'm born in 1994. Um, so we are often the very first generation of only child in our families. In my survey, when I asked them, are you an only child? And 78% of them claim, yes, I am. So we got a, a huge population with a high concentration of only child that is staying, staying with us right now. Then let me ask you this. If you have only one child in your family, what influence does that place onto your family? Well, many things, I'm sure. But the thing I really want to point out is the family wealth concentration effect. In US, one woman generally gives birth to about two children, roughly. And up there, we have the super generalized, average out US family structure. We have two parents on top and two children in the bottom. 
And also, from my past four-year experience studying here and interact with our U.S. students, I noticed there's a strong emphasis in U.S. culture of personal independence. Then, when we look at the lifespan of this family, as the children get older, we see a clear boundary between the parents' family and the children's family. Also, the family wealth are often split by the same way, same pattern as well. Then when we look at our, our Chinese student, our Chinese students are, uh, are mostly come from a family that looks like this. We have two parents on top, only one children in the bottom. And also, what the Chinese culture is really different from our US culture is that we have this emphasis of, of the idea of filial piety. We call it xiao or xiao dao. That is simply a strong notion to respect the elders and to take care of them one day when they need it. In my survey, I asked my, my participants whether they agree with these two statements. After my parents get older, I will be the main person that they rely on. 81% of them claim, yes, I agree. And then, my parents will one day need my income to sustain their life quality. And almost half of the students claim, yes, I agree. So we see a strong family bond here, connecting these two layers of generations. And this family wealth, the boundary that, that um, separates these two parts of the family wealth is rather blurred. What also very impressed me is that, you know, all of my participants, they're all college students, they're in their early 20s, and they have this strong notion, so early on in their life, to one, one day to give back to their family and take care of them, their parents when they need it. Then what about our college students? The parents will have the, strong, the same strong feeling of obligation as well. I mean, all this money and all these resources provided by our parents, all this good stuff even got concentrated onto this one child. So although you might see our Chinese students seems to have more disposable income compared with our domestic students, but it does not necessarily mean we come from a very wealthy family. For my family, my dad is an accountant you know, in the company that he worked for, and my mom is a high school teacher. So I'm actually from a very average family, but I still managed to get here, pay the tuition, and have a rather qual quality life. So the reality is actually very different um, than what we have been portrayed in all those Asian Kim Kardashian stories have been telling around our campus. Let me share you a, a story, of, a, another story about my family. Just like most of the other inter Chinese international students, I am the only child in my family too. So every time my parents, when they, when they sent me off at the airport when I was getting ready to leave for US, we always have a very emotional and difficult time. Because my parents simply knows next time they could possibly see me is one year later. So for me, as the children in this family, I try to make sure to go back and visit once a year. Sometimes I set my work and my study aside and I would just buy a ticket and take off. And I suddenly realized my parents recognized not on my winter clothes. <laughs> my dad once asked me, Aiden, I think your jacket looked quite nice. When did you get that? And I answered him, Dad, you know what? I've been wearing this jacket for like four years. <laughs> And that is the time I suddenly realized how much time and how many moments we have missed out from each other's life. Simply, I've been here for so long and we're so far apart. My situation is the same with many other Chinese international, international families as well. So this missed time sometimes can only be made up with money. In another word, money becomes the way for our parents to express their concern and love, simply be because they cannot be here with us. And just on top of that, a lot of our parents, they never had any experience to go abroad as a student. A lot of them haven't even left China for their whole life. So it's really difficult for them to picture what a US life could, could be. 
During my interview I had with a Chinese girl, she told, once told me a story about her family. So the way a lot of our uh, international students get their, get their spending money when they first got here is through a kind of a credit card. Um, this card normally issued in pairs, so two of them. And one goes with the children to the US, and another one got kept uh, back in China by the parents. I used to get one of those two. Um, the one I had was, had a really lovely name. It's called Mommy and Son Card. <laughs> <laughs> so for the case of this girl, um, every time she swiped her card over, over in the US, her dad will get a phone notification, a message of uh, how much money and where the money is spent. So there was a time she tried to Skype her parents. The time this, the signal was connected was the time she suddenly heard her dad's voice asking her in a very anxious tone. He said, are you okay? Are you doing fine? Why didn't you spend any money in the past two weeks? What's going on? And she suddenly realized that was because of Bank of America card she's using now, and her dad just simply won't get phone notification. <laughs> but you see, the phone notification, tiny small things like this, almost become a window for the parents to get an idea of her girl's daily life could possibly be. And losing this window is just simply powerful enough to freak out and mature, experienced strong man like her dad. And this sense of connectivity and this sense of family bond becomes even much more dramatic when it comes to buying a car for her children. When I ask my participants, you know, representing their families, to rank these four categories in terms of their importance when they buy their car, economics, which is the category representing the price and, you know, all the financial spendings associated with this purchase, this category is got thrown to the very end of that list. But safety, to my surprise, becomes the top number one concern of these families. So our parents are so willing to pay, they care least about how much money are they spending. So, but they want to make sure their children get a safe, nice car. So although they have such a blur image of what a US life could be, they don't understand what's going on in, in her children's daily life, but when we are driving our, our car on the road, our parents want, want, want us to be 100% certain that we are perfectly safe. So the story of Chinese students buying all these high-quality cars or all these spending habits, this story is actually never about young kids showing off their family wealth, but rather it's, about, it's a story about the family bound, which gets stretched by this great with distance, but always consistent with love. And I believe the reason why there's a lot of misperception, misunderstanding out there is simply just because people, people don't understand each other enough. So one thing I really hope all of you can do is why not start to get to know one or two people from a cultural group that is different from you? After a while, you'll notice we actually share much more similarity than difference. We all care about our family and we all do whatever we can possibly do to take care and protect them. And just on top of that, there's another thing we all share in common here. We are all proud members of our Spartan families. This is Spartanville. Thank you very much.